Would you pray with me? God, we gather here today praying that your word will speak to us, that it will fill us, that it will help us to guide us on our way as we live out the calling that you have placed on each of our individual hearts in this world. And now may those words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you now and forever, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning we are beginning a new message series, one that will go throughout the summer and it is intentionally one that is going to be about individual stories of witness, of testimony, of proclamation about the power of God working in and through our lives. Forgiving us, changing us, yes, even transforming us for new things, for new ministry, for a new way of creating God's kingdom in the world. And so I'm really excited about this message series because I am going to be up preaching a few of these messages, but we're also going to be having members of our own congregation that we're going to be sharing their own testimony and witness to the power of God working in their lives. So I hope that as many Sundays here this summer, as you can be here to hear these inspirational and powerful stories, that you can come and be a part of that and in your own way share your own stories. And if that might be through an email message to me or through a prayer that you lift up, that you will still be able to take your own story and see it as a witness and a testimony this summer and how we can begin to proclaim those stories into the lives of our community and into the world. And it just so happened, as Bev was mentioning earlier, that our new cemetery marker stone was put in place this week. Now, I tend to go down to our little church cemetery a few times, especially when the weather gets nicer like this. But I had the occasion to go and spend some real time there this week as the marker stone was being put in place. And many of you know, uh, it's hard to imagine, it's now been almost two years that our pastor and friend, Obed Hoffland, went to be with God and to be in God's eternal kingdom. We were blessed that his ashes, his remains are now in our United Church of Christ Cemetery. And so I got to go and spend a little time with Obed this week. And Obed is a very special person in my life. And I have a wonderful father who I will be calling later today and thanking him for all that he has done for me in my life. But I think we also have other father and parent figures in our lives. And Obed was certainly another father figure in my life. When I came to this church, Cottage Grove United Church of Christ, in 2002 as an intern, I knew nothing about parish ministry. And let me tell you, in seminary they teach you a lot of things, but uh, practical day-to-day -day ministry experience is not always one of them. We deal with a lot of the head stuff in seminary. We deal with your theology and constructing it and deconstructing it, but... Practical ministry experience is another thing, and when I got to Cottage Grove United Church of Christ, I had a great mentor in the faith in Obed Hoffland, who helped me see my gifts and skills for ministry, but also my growing edges, where I needed to learn, where maybe I just wasn't seeing a need for ministry, but it was right in front of me, and Obed was a Philip to me, coming alongside, 
walking with me on my journey of faith, sharing wisdom and opening up the scripture to me, God's ways, God's word. And so I look back in my life and I see the power that those mentors, those who accompany us, those who journey with us, the power that those people have upon our lives. And it makes me realize just where God is working in and through. Because it's those people, when we look back upon our lives, we see how they have been guiding us, leading us, not always of their own abilities, but because God's Spirit is in them as well. And those mentors in their own ways are baptizing us into a new way of being and living in the world. And I could share multiple stories about other mentors in my life. But I think it's powerful to also hear the story of how mentors have influenced and impacted other people as well. And so this week I found a wonderful daily guide post. It was a blog post a few years ago by a a person that many of you know and have heard of, but I'm not going to reveal who this person is until the end. Because I want you to hear his story for what it is and how those mentors guided and transformed his life. His blog begins by saying, one of my favorite verses of the Bible, Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up children in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Powerful words, aren't they? They remind us of how important it is to give children a firm foundation. Show me a successful individual and I'll show you someone who had real positive influences in his or her life. I don't care what you do for a living. If you do it well, I'm sure there was someone cheering you on, showing you the way. A mentor. I've had that push in my life going back as far as I can remember. He says, here's how mentors can make a difference. Here's what they did for me. He says, the first push outside my own home came at the boys club in Mount Vernon, New York. I spent a lot of time there as a kid. My parents couldn't always be home when I was done with school. They were too busy working. My mother worked in beauty salons. My father was a preacher. He had a couple of churches, one in Virginia, the other in New York. In addition to that, he always had at least two full-time jobs. From the time I was six, the boys club was my whole world. I learned how to play ball there and how to focus and set my mind on a goal. I learned about consequences and the difference between right and wrong. At the heart of the place was a force of nature named Billy. He made each of us feel like we were something special. I was so impressed with him that I started to imitate him. I would walk like Billy and try to shoot a foul shot like Billy. I would try to sit like him and treat others with respect like he did. I even practiced signing my name like Billy. There was a real flourish to his handwriting, and I used to copy it so much I can still see it in a way when I sign my own signature. One of Billy's great innovations was to hang college pennants from the walls of the club's main hall. One for each school his kids went to attend. The deal was when you graduated from high school and went away to college, you had to send Billy a pennant. 
and he'd put it up proudly on the wall for the rest of us to see. Boston University, Syracuse, Vanderbilt, Marquette, schools I'd never even heard of. I used to look at these names and think, man, anything is possible. Gus Williams, a great ball player from my neighborhood, was a couple years ahead of me. He went out to USC on a basketball scholarship, and I can still remember standing out in the hallway looking up at his USC pennant, thinking, if Gus can make it, then I can make it too. I'd never been anywhere, didn't even know where California was, but if a guy from Mount Vernon could get a scholarship to a great school, why couldn't I? On 3rd Street in Mount Vernon, there was a barber shop called The Modernist, run by a man named Jack Coleman. I started working there at the age of 11 or 12 because I wanted to make some money. Jack Coleman took me on as a kindness to my mother, I'm sure, but I thought that was the best job in the world. I was Mr. Coleman's cleanup guy, but the real money came in tips from customers. They'd step out of Mr. Coleman's chair, and I'd be on them with a whisk broom, brushing off their collar, saying, man, you look good. Is there anything I can do for you? There were rewards all day long, especially if you were respectful and solicitous. I also got to see how hard Mr. Coleman worked to make his business run. He wasn't just the head barber. He was like the modernistic's master of ceremonies, presiding over a wonderfully eccentric parade of souls. He was a strong individual and true to his word. The shop used to close at 6.30 so the barbers could get home to their families I'll never forget what he said once when someone walked in there at 6.35. Am I late, he'd ask. Nope, you're early. You're the first, Mr. Coleman said. You're the first one up tomorrow morning. (laughs) For high school, I got a modest scholarship to a prep school called Oakland Academy in upstate New York. There was only about six of us inner city kids, kids who might be labeled troubled youth. Truth was, we weren't troubled so much as we were caught between school and the streets. I never knew how my mother managed it, scraping by to meet the tuition balance. Years later, I was shown the old accounts ledger from Oakland, and there next to her name was the oddest numbers. $16, $37, One hundred nine dollars. I looked at those figures and saw my mother breaking her back to lift me up. One small payment at a time. At Oakland, I had an English teacher named Mr. Underwood. He always had us start the day by reading. He always wanted us to read the New York Times. In the beginning, I just thumb through the sports pages, but over time, I started to read some of the other sections. And that opened up a whole new world to me. I started caring about what was going on outside of my own small, protected environment. Vietnam was winding down. Watergate was ramping up. People were struggling to make ends meet. And I was soaking it all in through the morning paper. I ended up staying close to home when it came time for college. I went to Fordham University in the Bronx. At first, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, then a lawyer, then maybe a journalist. Midway through my junior year, I was asked to leave Fordham for a while until I figured out what I wanted to do, which is a nice way of saying I was on academic probation. But before I left, I took this public speaking class. I'd heard it would be an easy B. 
I don't even remember the name of the old guy who taught that class. I just remember his legs were always wrapped in ace bandages that would become unraveled. He might have looked scattered, but his mind wasn't. What he really loved was Shakespeare. One day he asked me to do a scene from Hamlet. I was terrified. I didn't think I could do it. But he must have seen something in me that I didn't see in myself. At the end, I was ready to race out of that classroom as fast as I could. I promised I'd never do something like that again. But that summer, I was a counselor at camp, and I performed on stage with kids. We did skits, and I started to really like being on stage. Maybe this was something I could do. After a performance, a man came up to me and said, Have you ever thought about being an actor? Well, you know, I said, playing it cool. I took a class in college, played Hamlet. My second go-around at Fordham, I switched to the school's Midtown campus where they had a real drama program. And I became passionate about acting. Bob Stone, my English teacher, was involved in the theater program and knew his stuff. He'd been on Broadway with stars like Paul Robeson and Jose Ferrer and had accomplished a lot. I told him I was serious about becoming an actor, and he encouraged me. More than that, he believed in me. And after I appeared in a student production of Othello, he wrote a letter of recommendation for me to grad school. What he basically said was, quote, if you don't have the talent to nurture this young man, then don't accept him. I must have read that letter a hundred times. Each time I thought, wow, if he thinks that I'm that good, then I'm going to have to live up to those words. He put a fire under me. For years, I kept that letter in my pocket, still have it. Whenever things become tough, I read it. There were times I wondered if I'd ever catch my first break, but Bob's words kept me going. I kept telling myself, it'll all work out. Something big is coming. Yes, I worked hard. I made some sacrifices until I finally made it. Yes, you could say I had some luck. But I also had tremendous help along the way. That was a huge blessing from God. Behind every great success, there's someone and often more than one person parent, teacher, coach, role model, it starts somewhere. And for Denzel Washington, it started in the boys club with Billy, at the barber shop with Mr. Coleman, at Fordham University with public speaking teachers and English professors. Where did it start for you? Who was there for you along the way? Who was there doing as Proverbs 22, 6 says, to train up your children in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from. Think about the people who have been a Philip in your life. And then ask yourself this very important question. How can I be a Philip to someone else in their life? There's no reason 
It can't start with you. Thanks be to God. Amen.